We took a uh, concept that made it a reality. That's not easy. World-renowned institutions have a way of perpetuating their own success. Greatness attracts greatness. So much so that when the bar is raised, it's hard to identify who, if any one individual, is responsible. That's the genius and the reward of collaboration. But every now and then, you get a leader whose single impact on your mission is undeniable. For Johns Hopkins Medicine, that leader is Ed Miller, a man who not only advanced the mission of discovery, but who arguably ushered in a revolution in medical education and healthcare delivery. I'm Sally Thorner, and it is my honor to tell Ed Miller's story about the profound transformation of a man and an institution, and the extraordinary teamwork that made it all possible. Many of us were really scared about the future of the institution. You know, Ed Miller and, and, and Ron Peterson saved Hopkins. The story really begins more than two decades ago when a storm was brewing inside Johns Hopkins. We went through this period of a great turmoil in the early 90s. The dean of the medical school and the president of the hospital were really knocking heads and it caused the trustees to have to step in. They absolutely needed to, to, to exhibit their trustee leadership, and they did. Ed Miller, at the time, was chair of anesthesiology at Hopkins. He was aware of the clash between the leader of the hospital and the medical school, but he had no idea what role he was about to play in solving it, until the phone rang one Sunday in February. It was the acting president of the university, Dan Nathans. Dr. Nathans said, can I come to your house? on Sunday morning, and I said, oh, Dr. Nathan, I'll be glad to meet you anywhere. No, I'd like to come to your house. So, so I told Lynn, uh, Dr. Nathan's coming, and I don't know what it's about. I said, hmm, something is up, and Ed said, oh, no, it's just something about research or something about the medical school. Ed set up in the library, and Dan came to the door, and they sequestered themselves. And an hour later or so, Dan left, and Ed came in and said, well, guess what? They've asked me to be the interim dean of the medical school. Parting comment to me was, uh, I think you should be the interim dean. Uh, send me your CV and give me your answer on Tuesday. As they all predicted, he was the perfect interim dean. It wasn't long before the board had an even bigger offer for the charismatic giant. The trustees really realized that they needed to bring together the emerge the School of Medicine and the Johns Hopkins Health System into a single organization and under a single leader. And after uh, a number of months, realized that uh, the best person for that position was Ed Miller. Mike Bloomberg walked over to me and says, congratulations, you're the new Dean CEO of Johns Hopkins Medicine. Don't screw it up. So there he was again, with the chance of a lifetime, but a challenge equally as epic. This first challenge was to integrate the different segments of medicine. We used to call them the smokestacks of medicine because there were hospitals, the research center, and of course the uh, education. And they each had their own budget, their own leader, and their own oversight. And what we needed to do, what we had to do, was to bring them all together. We had to make a single entity with a common purpose. We did not give him a playbook. He basically walked into that office with a title and had to build the organization and, and provide a vision for the future. He became the symbol of putting the pieces back together again. I always had the feeling everybody wanted me to succeed because they wanted the institution to succeed. Creating harmony within the institution was possible largely because of his instant chemistry with the president of Johns Hopkins Hospital, Ron Peterson. I think Ron is probably the hardest working person I've ever known in my life. Truly. I mean, I know a lot of people work hard, but I don't know anybody who works harder than he does. And I'm sometimes painting the sky, and he's trying to make sure I don't fall off the ladder. Oftentimes, he'll get out there a little bit uh, uh, with the broader thinking, uh, with a little bit more of the risk-taking, and I'm sort of propping him up and sometimes pulling him back a little bit. So I'm a little bit more reserved, perhaps. 
An improved atmosphere set the stage for the real revolution to begin. After setting the standard in medical education over a century ago, Hopkins embarked upon transforming it again, balancing the needs of research, education, and patient care that is the hallmark of Hopkins. There was now new science offering a whole new way to teach. He as dean recognized the need for revision uh, to the curriculum for our medical students and made it his business to assemble uh, the team to go about the business of doing that. He gave all of us the mandate to create uh, a curriculum that would be far-sighted and would take our students into the next century. And this ultimately became the Genes to Society curriculum. New curriculum has changed the, the way clinical care is uh, done because the students come on the service asking questions in a different way than before. They want to understand the diseases that we treat and how they can be improved upon. And so there's this constant questioning that takes place on using the best of science to advance clinical care. State-of-the-art science, teaching, and clinical care naturally demanded state-of-the-art facilities and systems. After all, the environment should be as smart as the people working in it. We were conducting ourselves in 30, 40, 50, even a couple of 60-year-old buildings. And that just wasn't going to work going forward. Even though we knew it would take billions of dollars and a decade to complete. I said, don't tell me how we can't do it, tell us how we can do it. Monuments to Ed's determination can be seen from almost any window. I think it's not an accident that we've been able to maintain our standing as the uh, number one funded medical school in the country. What he's done is he's built research buildings that match the research support we got and we have, the research faculty that we have. More than 10% of the basic science faculty are members of the National Academy of Sciences. An extraordinary feat. We have over 150 trials where our faculty members are actually hold the IND, the ID, are responsible for the design and the innovation in this study. That's pretty unusual compared to the, um, you know, to the rest of the country. When uh, the basic science directors were trying to uh, come together to st set up this institute for basic biomedical sciences, um, Ed uh, was, was supportive of us doing that and um, helped us form um, a group to move forward. And now uh, that institute uh, really has taken off and we have a number of young investigators. Attracting and retaining the best and the brightest is a long-standing tradition at Hopkins and the ability to do this starts at the top. Medicine is not just science, it's an art as well. And Ed can recognize unique things in people. He just doesn't look at the formulas and the numbers. He, he's recruited every department chair in the School of Medicine, some two and three times over. They are the ones that then go out and recruit the faculty, the top-notch faculty. So if you don't have the right leadership, you're not going to get the right faculty to come here. If you look at the U.S. News and World Report ratings, What's not important to me is that you're rated number one. It's the fact that you are rated within the top three or four within 16 of those 17 or 18 specialties. That's the breadth of success. The Hopkins community is driven by a shared mission. So it was fortunate that Ed Miller spoke the language of teamwork. There is something called Hopkins collegiality. And that is part of the very, very deep culture at Johns Hopkins. And Ed, in my opinion, epitomizes that. It's very clear that science and medicine has changed so that you need teams to solve complicated problems. And Ed has catalyzed that. He catalyzed it by permitting a number of us to really initiate and carry out the activities of a number of institutes, Institute for Genetic Medicine. The Institute for Cell Engineering, the Institute for Basic Biological Sciences are all examples of programs that developed to support that under Ed's leadership. Where he promoted teams to solve problems, he encouraged autonomy to blaze new trails. He gives you power and, and, the, and the authority to accomplish things. And that's why he has people that do that, you know, around him. He allowed me to chart my own path, have my own freedom to decide where we were going, uh, with feedback along the way, and then enjoyed what you created. Part of why I felt confident is I had very good people around me. Having good people around him evolved to mean one thing in particular, diversity. As Ed saw, diversity and inclusion were not just good ideas, they were a matter of survival. To attract the best faculty and staff, 
this community has to embrace that as a principle of why people want to be here. In order to be the best at what we do, we really need the perspectives of people from so many different backgrounds, people with different types of ideas and skill sets is what makes us excellent, and I think Dean Miller gets that. Dr. Miller decided that his every other year retreat uh, to the Eastern Shore where the senior faculty would focus on diversity and disparities and issues related to that issue. He set the vision for us. Um, to set these very audacious goals. In fact, he called them BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals for us uh, to make sure that diversity and inclusion were a part of our long-term plans here. He changed surgery. When you look across the country now, uh, this year, 60% of our applicants were women. 10 years ago, it was 10%. And the candidates are fabulous. There were other times when profound change came as a result of tragedy. It really struck home, I would say, when Ellen Roche died. The death of Ellen Roche, a 24-year-old research volunteer, shocked everyone in the Johns Hopkins family. I think that was perhaps the hardest time of his, of his being Dean. The hardest time because um, it was a human life and he felt responsible for that human life. Ed's darkest days at Hopkins were not a chance to make excuses, but to face the facts head on with reflection, humility, and a promise to do better. It was difficult for people to admit that we had actually done something wrong. I think one of the things I did was I wasn't in my office very much. I was out talking to people. Here's where we are. Yes, we didn't do this thing right. Here's what we're going to do to fix it. Yes, OHRP is in here. Yes, they closed it down. We're up and running Monday morning. I was on the phone with Tommy Thompson all the time. There were many difficult decisions to be made during that and every time I went to Ed with an issue or a problem which you could see how there might be a temptation not to face it squarely to sweep it under the rug. He never did that. He always said do the right thing no matter the cost, no matter the publicity. Where Ellen Roche's death prompted an overhaul of research volunteer protocols, the loss of 18-month-old Josie King put a microscope on patient safety. We began to realize, with the help of Josie's mother, that we really had to renew our commitment to quality and safety. And it was his courage, I think, to really lead that and make that a forefront and a priority that was very important. Dr. Miller had a retreat, and I was asked to speak about safety. And we discussed what we would cover, and I asked him to open up the meeting reading about several adverse events that happened. He looked at me quizzically and said, you want me to do what? Because at the time, these events weren't shared broadly. They stayed in risk management. And he said, you know, you're right. We need to be transparent. I will lead the way. And he opened this most breathtaking meeting reading from our Sentinel events, and that changed everything which triggered a revolution in the quality and safety of patient care at Hopkins. Every conference we had, we had to start with a safety message. So he's put it up front. So not only is this the best hospital in the United States, it's the safest hospital in the United States. What's best for the patient has always strengthened Ed Miller's resolve. Look at the difference in the rooms. Whether he was weighing the benefits of managed Look care the or the integrated medical record system EPIC, he made bold choices and never looked back. In the 90s, we were in the middle of the managed care revolution and we thought everybody was going to be in managed care plans. And we were courted by many different suitors to sort of be the one to put together a huge network of physicians, for example, to make sure we were ready for managed care. And Dr. Miller, after looking at all the pieces and evaluating everything, said, you know, that just doesn't hold true to the mission. We're not going to do it. And it was the best deal we never did. Our decision to go to Epic, uh, that was a decision that uh, we spent a lot of time on, a lot of uh, uh, deliberation. I said, this is not an issue about whether we can afford it. This is strategic priority. We've got to figure out, we'll figure out how to pay for it, but we have to do it. I think he knew that going forward, in view of where healthcare is going, we must have an integrated medical record because it's the right thing for the patient. 
Taking the nation's top medical system into the next century requires bold leadership and funding. Ed Miller was Johns Hopkins Medicine's chief fundraiser, presiding over a campaign that brought in $2.2 billion, more than any other academic medical institution has attracted in a single campaign. These are all the employees that donated to the building. Isn't that nice? He has those critical attributes of a good fundraiser, and that is he's got big ears, which means he's a great listener. He's got a slow tongue because he listens more than he speaks, and he's got a big heart. And that means that the, those people who are giving him money understand that that gift is going to be used with compassion to change medicine. Donors are critically important to this institution. People think of development as uh, you go out and ask for money. It's, they really don't know what they're talking about then. That's not what development is. Development is talking and developing relationships with people. And, and then what you give them is a smorgasbord of opportunities. And if they want to help, we'll figure out a way to let them do it. But I don't ask for money. I've never asked for money. Ed Miller's geniality has paved the way for unprecedented growth for Johns Hopkins Medicine, improving access to care around the region, the country, and the world. Uh, we've grown um, from uh, 18 practices to 36 practices, uh, from 120 doctors to nearly 400 doctors. Um, so we've increased our capacity to bring Hopkins into the communities. Under Ed Miller, Johns Hopkins Bayview has served not only the neighborhood, but true to Johns Hopkins has served the world. One of the things that Dr. Miller understood that change in healthcare was going to put more pressure on the smaller community hospitals and their physician communities and that there was a role for Johns Hopkins to play in providing support uh, in the ability to develop an integrated system of care. And because of his vision um, we are doing that now, and that's the exciting work that he's actually leaving behind. Increasingly, over the last decade, we've gotten involved in many other countries, consultative arrangements, in some cases we're actually managing uh, hospitals under Ed's leadership. That, that portion uh, of Johns Hopkins Medicine business has really grown quite dramatically. In order to continue our preeminence and achieving our mission, we needed to become global. We needed to reach out into the world. The influence of Ed Miller and Johns Hopkins Medicine reaches from Baltimore to Bahrain to Barack Obama's health care reform. Ed has been at the vanguard of health care reform in the United States. Uh, he has been a passionate advocate for academic medicine, and he's earned the stature, he's earned the respect of uh, colleagues throughout the system. And and built together a coalition that has been ferociously protective of uh, the health care uh, system in this country, of making it stronger and of protecting patients. During the health care debate, Dr. Miller brought to me all of that incredible experience, all of that know-how, so that when we were working to, with President Obama, to improve universal access, break the stranglehold of insurance companies, both on patients and on the people who deliver great care. He had ideas that will help patients, ideas to help save medicine, to reform the delivery system, and at the same time, maintain cutting edge uh, research. Of all of his bold accomplishments, how does Ed Miller want to be remembered? He hopes it's for the little things. Sometimes I see him be what's like a little boy. I think it's just fine, don't you? <laughs> That's good. I think what you can say about Ed is, number one, the allegation that he's just a pretty face isn't really accurate. I don't think he's that good looking, if you really want to know. We have just developed such a good rapport over the years. I just, I love him. I love him. He does care about who we are as an individual and not just what we bring to Johns Hopkins. Do you know Susan has a daughter that's a nice skater? Everywhere he went, I don't know who he passed in the hall, whether it was a, a nurse's aide or a lab tech or somebody pushing a broom or one of the police officers. It was, hi Susie, how's your family? I hear your kid was sick, I hope he's better. It uh, creates havoc with schedules because you have to plan an extra 10 minutes to get somewhere uh, because of that. Oh! 
pancakes, baby. It's a complete open door, and I know that I'm sure others will say this. Uh, knock on the door, Ed, you got a minute? Absolutely. You've read a book called The Velveteen Rabbit? You know, he's somebody who's real. You know exactly what you get with Ed. I mean, there's no subterfuge. Uh, he's been a great partner for me. I'm really going to miss him. Above all, Ed Miller had a singular focus on the promise of medicine. Hopkins' commitment to providing the most innovative discoveries and the most collaborative and compassionate care available. By continually pushing boundaries, Hopkins is eliminating mystery surrounding disease and redrawing the lines of treatment and possibility. He's not only left it in a, in a, in a much better condition than he found it, but uh, he's ensured that uh, the folks who come after us uh, will uh, be in a great position to continue the tradition.